a chemical spill contaminating the water supply in nine West Virginia counties. This year alone, over 300,000 people in West Virginia had their drinking water contaminated. What are the health effects of having these drugs in our drinking water? It's forced medical treatment without the consent of residents. My friends, water filtration is one of the most basic actions you can take to protect you and your family from the harmful toxins and heavy metals in your tap water. On average, the county says it sprays with the glyphosate at least once a week. Few filters cut out the glyphosate that is found in water supplies worldwide. Remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, hydrofluorosilicic acid, sodium hexafluorosilicate. Fluoride it is in tea, it's in coffee, it's in water, it's in bread, it's in toothpaste. It is our responsibility to protect our families. The establishment's not going to do it. It's time to take action. It's time to filter our water. Visit InfoWarsStore.com and use promo code WATER to get 10% off their entire family of incredible products. Or call toll-free 888-253-3139. Hi folks, Alex Jones here with some important information. I want to tell you about Matt Redhawk and his team of patriots over at My Patriot Supply. Several years ago, Matt was sitting in his two-bedroom apartment, frustrated with the direction this country was headed, and the charlatans willing to sell us out for a quick buck. Deciding to take action, a company run by Patriots for Patriots was born. My Patriot Supply has never taken a loan or accepted outside funding. They now operate two distribution facilities and employ over 50 hardworking American men and women. It is rare to find companies who practice what they preach. And that's why I stock my pantry with high-quality storable foods from My Patriot Supply. Go to MyPatriotSupply.com forward slash Alex today for special offers on emergency food storage or call their preparedness specialist at 866-229-0927. That's 866-229-0927. Do business with someone who shares your values. MyPatriotSupply.com slash Alex. In the near future. When you realize how fake it all is, the football, the security basketball. Alert. Security alert. This is Homeland Security. Analysis. InfoWars building independent media operations. You let the worst people get controlled and tell us that we are the ones responsible. Prime Directive discredit Alex Jones. Jones is the wildly popular conspiracy theorist. It's a popular conspiracy theory talk show called InfoWars. Alex Jones is now in an Austin jail. These people are assaulted. Targeting of Patriots engaged. They are never going to stop. They're never going to deviate from their program until we stop them. Block free iPhone app at infowars.com. Block free podcast and video feed. Imperative destroy Prison Planet TV. You gotta set your eye on the enemy, not worry about what propaganda they put out intellectually. It's begun. You can feel it. From the InfoWars.com studios, it's Alex Jones. John DiBartola is our guest at MiddleEarthNetwork.com. One of the most successful literary fiction franchises of all time. It's up in the top three or four. On record, one of the biggest movie franchises of all time, The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbits, The World of Middle Earth. And when you study politics and the power behind the throne, the all seeing eye of the Illuminati, clear archetypes. So it was probably 15 years ago, I started reading some of the books that had fragments of the Tolkien interviews and things where he did liken it to World War I, World War II, different powers, the way political systems work, tyranny versus liberty. And you could clearly see that he knew a lot as a top linguist and more. But our guest has done a lot of studying, helped ferret out folks that had, uh, you know, the, 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 this rare interview that's that's going to be doled out, I guess, over the next few months. We're going to air a first little clip here today. Uh, but John, uh, break it down again. Uh, how you ran into this? Where and from from your deep research, where J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, you know, stands from his political view way back when this was recorded in what year in 1950? Uh, this, yeah, it was recorded. The The public recording was made in 1958 at what was called a Hobbit's Dinner. Uh, this was the first time, it, what's amazing about this tape too, it's so many firsts. This is the first time that Tolkien went out of the country for a quote unquote fan dinner. 
uh, like this. So, uh, so it's a first in many ways, and it's a complete recording from beginning to end. Uh, so out on the internet, you'll find like fragmentary recordings of Tolkien and interviews, but never have we heard him before in a natural setting where he's able to deliver a speech from beginning to end. So that, that's what really makes this tape unique. But my friend Rene uh, von Rossenberg uh, from Holland, and this will happen really through the Tolkien Society, the British Tolkien Society. Uh, we're all fr friends together. And uh, Rene von Rossenberg was doing uh, research for a white paper he was going to deliver at a celebration at the Tolkien Society. He knew about this speech that uh, that Tolkien had delivered at this Hobbit's dinner in 1958 in Rotterdam. So he went to Rotterdam to research the speech, and in his research, interviewing people that were still surviving that were at at the dinner, he came across the family of the man who actually this was a hobbyist, a, a tape hobbyist. Remember, this is 1958. Real to real is fairly new. So this guy would record all the speeches at these events. And the family said, oh, we've got this tape. Uh, you can have it. So as a Tolkien fan, Rene was literally bes beside himself. He didn't know what was going to be on the tape. Brings the tape back, plays it, and nearly falls on the floor uh, because you, you've got this entire speech from J.R.R. Tolkien. And in the speech, uh, like I said before, we, we're hearing Tolkien like we've never heard it before. He's he's emotional. He's jovial. He's joking. Uh, but at the same time, he's very serious. He's talking about the direct meaning of the Lord of the Rings in a way that we've never heard him say before, even in his letters, uh, in such a definitive way. And there's just priceless quotes. Uh, well, I would call myself a novice Tolkien fan, not like sure. somebody who's really had the time to get into it deeply, but I've resonated with it. You obviously have done a lot of research into this, heading up one of the big societies uh, out there that's been very successful at, at, at digging out a lot of lore. Uh, tell us a little bit about this really interesting man, because the more I've read about him, he was really an interesting person. Well, like you said earlier in the introduction, uh, he fought in the trench warfare of, of, uh, of World War I. Uh, he, you know, most of his friends, uh, his his school friends, his college friends, uh, I think only one of his friends made it through World War I. Uh, and he himself uh, uh, was sick in the war, and uh, but he survived through. And obviously, the trench warfare had a, an immense and great effect uh, on Tolkien himself. Now, he, did, he wasn't writing direct allegory, and, and you'll hear many scholars say this, and Tolkien himself said it very many times, that he was not a great fan of direct allegory. He would like the themes to be taken up in the story himself. Someone like his friend C.S. Lewis was very interested in direct allegory. This but, was an indirect allegory. It's not like the screw tape letters that's direct. Right. He would call he would call it applicability. He would say what he was writing, you could make it very uh, very applicable. Sp specifically, the ring. The ring would be a symbol for power. Uh, and if you read through his letters, and I would highly recommend anybody who's interested in not only the Lord of the Rings and and the fantasy stuff, but just Tolkien as a man and and a lot of the, maybe his politics and his beliefs to read his letters because most of his letters have been published in full. And I and I have I, I brought a bunch of quotes from him today. Uh, one of my favorite quotes quotes from him, and this will, I think this will really appeal to you and your fan base, is his summation of evil in the world, okay? And this is back in 1969. He talks about what he calls the Hydra's heads, and I'll read the quote verbatim from him. He says, the spirit of wickedness in high places is now so powerful and so many headed in its incarnations, there seems nothing more to do personally than to refuse to worship any of the Hydra's heads. The world, he thought, seemed little better than a new Tower of Babel, all noise and confusion. So even back in 1969 and way before that, in, in the 30s and the 40s, he was writing about the level of corruption that had re reached what he would call, quote unquote, the central planners. And he just described the New World Order so eloquently. Right. Right, exactly. And, and I, you know, uh, I, I think I've heard you say before, you know, uh, these people who he would call whisk, whiskered men with bombs, they're playing multi-level level chess, right? And, and the public is, is, is barely playing checkers. Yeah. Uh, so, you, you know, so... So, uh, right, the, the, the level of corruption at many levels is that many-headed hydra. Listen, uh, I have had billionaires and globalists literally up in the top of big buildings, just like Gandalf going in to talk to Saruman, literally say, you must join with the New World Order. 
I mean, and, and that's why I went and saw the movie. I'm like, I remember reading that book 20 years ago, and it's like, that's really how they act. I've been given that speech. And so I guess Tolkien is a high-level professor and others, he'd run into that, surely. I mean, they're literally selling you on how evil's the way to go. And so, you know, he says it's not direct allegory, and I'm not comparing myself to Gandalf. I'm just saying that's the speech they give you is that, you know, I, I am Saruman of many colors. Well, you have to have a balance. Join with Lucifer. Join with the great eye. The power right. of Isengard is now at your command. <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, I think the disconnect for, for the average person is the average person, they see a person with a nice suit on and they cannot ever even fathom that that person might actually be evil. Uh, there's a great disconnect in modern society, and that's why uh, Tolkien is so brilliant, but because he shows in a, in a fantasy novel how deep evil can go, and it can affect the smallest person as well as the highest person in the world. Hey, let me ask you a question. Who came right. up with the battle armor of, of Sauron, uh, that was in the film that came out over a decade ago, and then in the new one when he walks out of the flame interdimensionally at that fortress when he when he when he de uh, defeats Gandalf. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I know it's described in the book, but not that way. Who came up with that battle armor? Well, that would pro that would probably be uh, one of the set designers uh, or or the armor designers. There was a lot of great armor and weapons designers working on on the film. Well, no, so. it's just that archetypally in a lot of Illuminati research I did. That's one of the highest level initiations that's how lucifer is described when he manifests right well there's definitely definitely a great similarity between the the what i would call these saronic characters in tolkien's legend well, no, i mean there's a god and there's these higher angels right. sauron's one of those he defects tries to destroy the creation and rebellion it is right. a christian allegory is it not right. Yeah, well, when you go, when you go deeper into the mythology and read the Silmarillion, which the Silmarillion is the back legends, the his, the history, so to speak, uh, that lays behind the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, it's actually Morgoth or or Melkor who is the satanic figure behind Sauron. So Sauron is not the ultimate evil figure in the mythology. It's actually Melkor who is controlling things from behind the scenes. Well, that's right. Doesn't and, I mean doesn't Melkor fall to earth and gets destroyed and then out of it it's kind of a reincarnation as Sauron? Right, exactly. Melkor is chained behind the door of night, and then the angels, the higher powers, uh, they give him pardon and let him out again. And he once again he wreaks havoc. He's not he's not redeemable. There's no repentance for for Morgoth. He's an absolutely true evil character, and that's what that's what's so brilliant about Tolkien. He represents evil in such a pure uh, and uh, uh, well described and way. Notice and notice, just like the cell phones really track everybody, they give us the technology. But with the back doors in it, they're giving right. us all the tech, but it's ruled by the one ring. I mean, he's telling you how the wizards run everything in the allegory. Exactly. And Tolkien himself was he was extremely frightened uh, and, and discouraged, really, at the level that machinery itself was was taking over the world. He There's predicted little computer gadgets would dehumanize us. Talk about that. Absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, another great quote from his letters, and again, I would I would highly recommend people, everyone, you, Alex Jones, go and read Tolkien's letters. It's an absolute lesson in this whole area. Uh, there's a quote where he talks about the war of the machines that has already begun. It made me think of Terminator when I read this quote, the war of the machines. And he says, well, the first war of the machines seems to be drawing to its final inconclusive chapter. Speaking about World War II, leaving a loss everyone the poorer, many bereaved or maimed, millions dead, and only one thing triumphant, the machines. As the servants of the machine are becoming a privileged class, the machines are going to be enormously more powerful. What's their next move? So, I mean, he's personifying the machine. Tolkien that, was a total visionary. Total visionary. And, and that's, the, that's part of my mission uh, and the Middle Earth Net, Network's mission, uh, mission is to make people see that it just wasn't about the story of the Lord of the Rings. Now, a lot of this is tied up in the story of, of the Lord of the Rings, but this was a brilliant man. Uh, and the Middle Earth Network is also one of the co-founders of the Mythgard Institute which is the very first online college uh, uh, allowing a master's uh, degree in what we call Tolkien studies, studying all the peripheral stuff that Tolkien himself loved and studied uh, and enriching people.
Wow. Well, you're a great interview. I want to have you back for a full hour soon. This is amazing. Absolutely. I'm glad you I'm glad you contacted us. I want to play 